welcome to the Wednesday webinar. Uh, for those of you who are here for the first time, uh, my name is Josh Gregory. I am one of the directors here on our consulting side of the organization. Uh, for everybody else who's been here and is here every week, uh, welcome back. Um, so just if you're, if you're new here, kind of just tune in for the first time. This is something where we try to provide value and information for everyone um, and, and make it really informative, but also have a little bit of fun. Uh, so I'll be co-hosting with Bridget today, uh, who is one of our consultants, and I'll bring her on a little bit later. But we also have a special guest that I'll introduce in just a second. Um, a couple of reminders before we get into it. Uh, first, there's a, a quick disclaimer that I have to read, as I do every week. Uh, Route Consultant is not endorsed by and is not recommended by Federal Express Corporation, FedEx Ground, or Amazon. Route Consultant is not sponsored by, is not approved by, is not associated with, and has no connection whatsoever with Federal Express Corporation, FedEx Ground, or Amazon. Uh, all that means you're not going to hear anything uh, materially non-public here today. We're not associated with them. So um, we do hope that we provide some real value, though, and information for everybody. Uh, and, and as a reminder for everyone, um, we'll do this uh, once we get to the Q&A at the end. But uh, as we do every week, uh, for us to answer one of your questions, you first have to answer one of ours. Uh, so the question of the day this week is, what is your favorite thing about fall? Uh, so we'll all answer that. But when you're typing in your questions later, uh, make sure you answer our question first. So what's your favorite thing about fall? So type that in and then submit your question. Now, uh, when you're submitting the question, put it in the Q&A down at the bottom. Uh, if you put it in the chat box, we'll miss it completely. We can only monitor one of them. So uh, make sure you put it in the Q&A and we'll make sure all of your questions are answered. Um, so today, uh, as I mentioned, we do have a special guest. Um, so I would like to introduce you all to Melody, who is the director of our HR team here. So she's gonna come on and talk through some best practices around the employee life cycle, the things that new contractors need to be aware of, and then all the things you need to pay attention to as we head into the end of the year. Uh, so Melody, you can go ahead and join us and let's see if we can get video to work today. There she is. Hey, Melody. Hello, hello, hello. Um, okay, so I guess I have to answer a question first. Yes. Okay, got it. So my favorite thing about fall is, um, that I get to have lots of orange. It's my favorite color. And so this is just a blanket excuse for the next you know, two and a half months to have orange everywhere. Um, you can see it even you know, in the video there. So, um, so there you go, that's my answer. That's my yeah, answer. yeah, I'll answer it quickly too and we'll have Bridget answer it later. Okay. Um, so my two favorite things about fall cheat, um, one is, that it's not hot anymore. Um, <laughs> I, I do not love Tennessee summers, been here my entire life and still don't love them. Um, and uh, in Tennessee, we get fall for like two weeks and they're the best two weeks of the year <laughs> before we head to winter, which I know some of you hear us talk about winter and winter here is like 30 is a really cold day. And for some of you, that's just, that's fall. Um, right. So yeah. Uh, and then the second thing is, is it's football season. Um, I can't say I watch as much football as I want to because my wife hates it, um, but it just makes me happier that it's happening. There you go. Just to know that it's in the, in the air. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Well, okay. Um, yeah, so for today, you know, I kind of thought going into peak season, um, if any of you guys were, you know, on that are on today were in Vegas with us and came to the employee management session, we talked a lot about the employee life cycle. Um, and really, there's kind of three stages to it, right? You have recruiting, retaining, and retiring um, those drivers. And, um, and, and going into peak, that makes it all just this stressful push for all of those components. Um, and so every other time of the year throughout the rest of the year, I would always say that retaining is the key. Retaining and retiring makes recruiting a whole lot less important, right? That's really kind of what it boils down to. But you're all about to ramp up and you're going to you're going to hire more drivers going into peak. So, you know, there's just a couple of key things that um, I wanted to point out and just kind of have you keep in mind before you get ready to hire um, hire those drivers. So first is decide what kind of hire you want to advertise for, right? When you go look for those candidates, um, you have the opportunity of kind of being distinct on, are you looking for seasonal drivers? 
Do you hire drivers, but have them on a probationary period? Or do you just straight out of the gate, hire full-time or part-time drivers? And there's pros and cons to all of those, right? If you go in and you hire people that are seasonal, then right off the bat, you don't have to worry about talking to any of them about benefits, about you know any of the other long-term things that are gonna come with that, but it comes with a con. They know they're short timer. They always have short timers disease. And so you have to you have to balance that. Probationary period, they expect they're going to be full-time employees at some point. Um, but you can give them a longer probationary period so you can kind of stay on top of them a little bit more. And they kind of are in that, oh, I need to do my best because I want to keep my job. And so that's a win for you. Um, there's a couple key things to think about there. Number one, if they're probationary, you don't have to start them on the countdown of accruing PTO if you give that or, you know, some of the ancillary benefits and things like that. There is an ACA guideline that you have to follow that you have to keep up with for medical benefits if you offer that, but you have a little bit more flexibility if you, you know, you can even have different wages. So if you're doing hourly or by day um, wages, if they're a probationary classification, you can pay them a little bit less than your full-time drivers. And that's a win. And then of course your full-time employees, part-time, you know, that's just straight out of the gate. And everybody's got a different business model and setup. And so you just kind of have to decide what do I think will get the right candidates in the door for me? Um, and, and just kind of figure out, you know, what you want that to look like. Um, I, I don't love the probationary pe period. It's not one that I typically would go to, um, but seasonal is great because then you know, I have them on my budget for this long. And as long as I can keep them safe and happy for that long, then come December 26th, we can all go home, you know, and so um, and so it, it can it can work well depending um, on on what you want to do with that. But once you have them in the door, and once you're ready, you know that's kind of the recruiting piece. That retaining piece is in the middle, right? And so getting them onboarded correctly is going to help with that retention piece. So a couple key things for that phase of the new hire situation is number one, make sure all of you have your handbooks up to date. It's it's just that that boring phrase that HR people will tell you is where's your handbook? Where's your handbook? Did you give them a handbook? And we're going to keep saying it. It's not going to change. Um, I absolutely believe that right before peak is a great time to check your handbook and roll it out because you are about to have a bunch of new employees come in. And so you want to make sure that you really are on point with what you've got in there. Um, doesn't have to be a war and peace novel. It can be short and sweet. Ours literally is about 20 pages long and that's it. And, and it's perfect. It's great. It's simple. It's easy. And it doesn't, you know, it doesn't overcomplicate anything. Um, all of you that are in employee centric states, so your Californias, your Oregons, your New Yorks, some of the others, you definitely want to make sure that you are updating that handbook before you bring on your uh, new employees, right? Mm -hmm. You want to make sure that it is consistent with as, as up to date information for your state as you can possibly make it. Um, and then you want to give yourself wiggle room to be able to terminate and retire those employees that maybe don't fit the standards that you need. And one of the things that we talked about in Vegas is the key phrase. And this is what if, if anybody here is paying attention and listening to this part, this is what I want you to take away. But your key phrase is any violation of company policies, procedures and expectations, either written or verbally delivered by management may lead to disciplinary action up to and including immediate termination. That, that key phrase is what you need to make sure that you can handle situations quickly and efficiently, and that's in any state. So you need to make sure that you are documenting that and that you have that in your handbook so that everybody knows it can be one and done if your employee is not the right fit for you. And the worst thing you can do, even during peak, and I know everybody's stressed out during peak, the worst thing you can do is keep a problem driver. It just really is because it, it the ripple effect is, is tenfold. Um, and when you give them that at the onboarding, then make sure they sign off on it, right? So if you have the ability to send it out electronically and you have an electronic trail, great. It's awesome. If you don't, even if you have a clipboard where you just have every new employee sign and date, yep, I was given an onboarding packet and it included the handbook then at least you know you have documentation. Yes, I gave it to them. Yes, they got it. If they read it, I don't know, but they got it, right? 
Um, and so that way you have it. And so when you then go to document these performance issues or the safety issues or whatever the case may be, they know this is where it's coming from and it's coming from the latest version you could have given them. So that's kind of a key thing. Um, and then, you know, a couple other things to think about as you're going into this, you've got a bunch of new drivers, right? A bunch of new drivers. So safety, 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 safety. We can all keep saying it. And um, it's really going to be huge because you have drivers that are now going to be new to the driving conditions, the weather conditions, construction's constantly changing. Everybody's stressed out because there's more packages, there's more to deliver, there's all these things. And, you know, there's a couple of statistics that are really a little bit hard to swallow for the business owners and for the HR side, right? So 40% uh, of all injuries that are reported for workers' comp happen with first-year employees. And there is a statistic that even uh, one out of every eight happen on the employee's first day. So you want to make sure that you are holding as many safety meetings as you can possibly have so that you can continue to, you know, give that message, deliver that message, make sure that everybody's listening, make sure everybody's getting it, they're hearing it repeatedly. And honestly, if you can do things like watch some of the video cameras, just see what are your drivers doing when they're out on the road? Do they really have on their seatbelts? Are they on their cell phones while they're driving? Are they blowing through stop signs? You know, whatever those pieces of the puzzle are, you can go on and you can see it. And if they're doing that and you're looking at it, then that is not the driver for you. It's just, it's just not. Um, and you don't want to risk a workers' comp case. They linger, they stay on forever, they can come back to haunt you, all of those things. And if you've done the handbook and you've updated it with any violation of the safety policy, can up, you know, can get you disciplinary action up to and including then you guys can move on down the road and you can find somebody that will do the job the right way. And there are plenty of people that will do the job the right way. We just have a few bad eggs in the mix. So, um, you know, there's a couple other key things, I think, um, when you're looking for how to survive peak season, um, look for those moments where you can give your good drivers a break. If there's a, you know, if there's a way that you can give them a jumper for a day or two, so they, they get to rest for a little bit, um, that's great. It's a great win. If you've got an HR person back at the office or at home or wherever they might be, say, hey, come be a jumper for a day and live the life of a driver and um, give them a break a little bit. Um, look for a way that, you know, maybe they can have a shorter route for a day or two. Ask them if they've got, you know, kid activities that they want to try to get to one. Try to give them those little wins where and when you can will help keep your good drivers and help them not be so frustrated during peak season. Um, you know, those are kind of those big things that's on the retention side. And then you've got the retire side, right? Um, and, you know, that, that retire piece of the puzzle is key. Um, you don't want to keep problem employees around. You just don't. And I, with RBCs, we can talk all day long about, okay, but I need them. Okay, I just need them one more week. Okay, I just need them through this season. It always ends up biting us in the backside every time. <laughs> it's just, it is one of those things that it ends up being a worse situation. So, you know, when, when you see that moment of opportunity to go ahead and retire those problem employees, you should do it. You should do it quickly. You shouldn't let it linger. And back to those employee-centric states, if you've let bad behavior continue and then you all of a sudden decide you're fed up and you're going to terminate them because of the things you've been allowing, that can bite you, right? They can come back and say, well, how was I supposed to know? You let me get away with it all this time and you didn't stop me. So how was I supposed to know that you were all of, all of a sudden going to come play bad cop, right? You've been doing the good side. Now you're going to be mean. What? How are we supposed to know that? And that'll get you. It'll, it'll just make your life much more complicated. So um, really, the best thing you can do is just retire them as quickly as humanly possible. And that, in and of a nutshell, is the employee life cycle. Perfect. All right. Thanks, Melody. And I'm sure people will have lots of questions and uh, kind of you have specific questions about stuff like make sure to put that into the Q&A. Um, before we get to that, though, uh, I'm going to bring on Bridget to go through the inventory for the day. Hey, Bridget. Hey. <laughs> All right, guys, uh, we had 10 new listings on our public site uh, this last week, and I'll just run through those real quick. Um, if you're not interested at all, go ahead and pop those questions in the Q&A box. 
Um, so we can start loading those in, but uh, we have some really good ones this week. So uh, listen up if you're in the market. I'll get started with P&D. We have, uh, this first one is out of North Milwaukee, Wisconsin. This is a 12 P&D route operation listed at 1.1 million. This is right around 92% of revenue. This one's currently operating around a 17% EBITDA margin. It's gonna come with one manager. Uh, this is a remote ownership opportunity for someone who's been looking. I feel like a lot of people uh, like those remote ownership uh, possibilities there. Um, it has a relatively new fleet, so that's going to cut on your repair and maintenance costs, um, which tend to get out of hand with an out of hand with an older fleet. Um, and then this is going to be a really dense CSA that's going to allow for um, you know fewer uh, trucks on the road to keep fuel costs down. So again, that was in North Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, next PND we have is out of Twin Falls, Idaho. Um, this one is a seven PND route operation listed at 600,000. That's right around 75% of revenue. Uh, this one's currently operating around a 19% EBITDA margin. It's going to come with one manager and one spare truck. Uh, there is assumable truck debt available on this listing. If you're looking for creative ways to finance a deal, um, that's always a great option. This is a rural operation uh, in a highly sought after location. So I don't know what they have going on in Twin uh, Falls, but apparently it's uh, the place to be. So if you're interested in that one, um, definitely some good things going on there. And they also have spare drivers available for contingency, which is um, important as we uh, talked about peak season. So uh, next PND we have is out of Las Vegas, Nevada. This is a five PND route operation listed at 1.18 million. This is around 130% of revenue. Uh, this one is currently operating at around a 27 to, uh, or 28 to 29% EBITDA margin, excuse me. Um, gonna come with one manager and three spare trucks and consists of reliable uh, drivers who are super experienced and know these routes well. So uh, looks like a very solid listing there in Las Vegas. Uh, next PND is out of West Columbus, Ohio. This is a 12 PND route operation listed at 1 million. That's right around 82% of revenue. This is currently operating around a 9% EBITDA margin. It's going to come with one uh, driving manager and two spare trucks. This is an extremely dense operation. So again, cutting down on fuel costs. Um, and you are going to get four spare drivers um, with this listing as well. Next one we have is out of Tampa, Florida. This is an 18 PND route operation listed at 620,000. Uh, that's only 32% of revenue. Uh, this one's currently operating around a eight to 9% EBITDA margin. It's gonna come with two managers and two spare trucks. Uh, obviously being down there in Tampa, it's in a very desirable beachside location. Um, and they have three spare drivers available for contingency. Uh, there as well. Uh, next up, we have uh, Southwest Wisconsin. This is a 10 PND route operation listed at 900,000. Uh, this is right around 69% of revenue, currently operating around an 18% EBITDA margin. It's going to come with one manager, uh, not one, not two, not three, but seven spare trucks, <laughs> uh, just in case you need a few extra. Uh, they also have eight spare drivers available for contingency, and this is going to be a set of uh, really rural routes. Um, out of upstate uh, South Carolina, we have two uh, portions of the business here that we carved up. Uh, the first one is six P&D routes listed at 400,000 um, at 63% of revenue currently operating around a 12% EBITDA margin. It's going to come with one spare truck. This is a great mixture of rural and urban routes if you're looking for uh, a mix there. You got a spare driver available for contingency and growth. Um, and this business specifically in South Carolina has really boomed um, in the last year. And they're actually transferring terminals uh, closer to where these routes are located. So uh, gonna be some fewer stem miles there for um, this South Carolina route. And uh, likewise, uh, the other carved portion of this business, 
Uh, similar, seven P&D routes listed at 650,000, right around 84% of revenue, operating around a 15% EBITDA margin. Uh, you get one spare truck with this. Again, a, a mix of urban and rural, uh, spare driver available for contingency. Um, and then again, this piece is also moving terminals to be closer to that CSA as well. All right. Uh, and then line haul, we had two line haul listings come out this last week, one out of Baltimore, Maryland, uh, nine line haul runs listed at 2.5 million. Uh, that's right around 75% of revenue operating around a 16% EBITDA margin. This is going to come with three spare trucks uh, in the line haul space. That's pretty hard to come by. So uh, that, that's pretty awesome there. It consists of three dedicated solo runs and six unassigned solo runs. So a good mix. Uh, you have six spare drivers available for contingency work. Um, and then if you are new to the space or didn't already know this, uh, your dedicated runs, that's going to offer you the guaranteed stream of uh, revenue and then those unassigned runs, um, that's going to be super important for adding points to your uh, truck values and then hopefully bidding on those and uh, turning them into something else. But uh, that is out of Baltimore. And the last one we have is out of uh, the Midwest region. This is six line haul runs listed at 1.7 million, and that's right around 84% of revenue. Uh, this one's currently operating around an 18% EBITDA margin. It's gonna come with one manager. Uh, it is a diverse portfolio of dedicated and unassigned runs with three of those being dedicated solos and three being unassigned. So a good 50-50 uh, split there. Um, and like I said before, those dedicated runs are awesome uh, to have in your portfolio just as a, a steady stream of revenue. So like I said, lots of good stuff coming out uh, in the brokerage just last week. So if you're interested in any of that, uh, let someone on our team know and we will send you more information. Perfect. Thank you, Bridget. Now, normally I'd answer, but I already answered. So, uh, oh, that's right. You're not <laughs> Okay, okay. What's, well, okay. Reminder for anybody who might have joined late, the question of the day is, uh, what is your favorite thing about fall? Yes. Okay. So this is tough. I love fall. Um, I used to be more of a summer gal, but in my old age now, I, I love the chill, <laughs> um, the cooler temperatures. So uh, really anything that has to do with being outdoors. I feel like when it finally cools down a little bit, they have so much going on. Um, I know here in Nashville they do, but like all the fairs and hiking and farmer's markets and um, yeah, just being able to get outside, you know, sleep with the windows open. My mom is really into pickleball recently. So I swear like every day after work, she calls me up, she's like, Bridget, you wanna go play pickleball? Like it feels great outside. <laughs> so. Just being outside and being active uh, gets kind of muggy down here in Nashville sometimes. So it's nice to have that relief. Yeah, I think those are, that's a great answer. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, well, we can get to the Q&A. Um, I know we probably should have repeated that that uh, question of the day. So I'll give a few of you a pass here, but if you want to load in your favorite thing about fall now, I will read it. Um, but we have a couple requests for a copy or a sample of an employee handbook. I know we have that. Um, if uh, Glenn, if we can't get that to you and, and drop it here on the webinar, if you reach out to someone on our team, we can we can definitely help you with that. Um, uh, this one is for you, Melody. Uh, this is coming from an anonymous attendee who really just love the colors of fall. So I think uh, you share that in common with your orange uh, affinity. <laughs> um, but they want you to repeat that really important statement you said <laughs> earlier. Hopefully you have that like with five stars around it. But if you can repeat it uh, maybe slowly so, so yeah. everyone can, can write it down, that would be great. Um, and just so, sure, happy to. And then just so you guys know, in our handbook, we actually have this in red italics in, <laughs> in, the, in, the, in the handbook, at, like on page two or three. It's like right up front. It's easy to see. So um, would it be, how about if I just copy this and put it in the chat notes? Can I do that? Yeah, put, um, it, put it in the chat, not the Q&A. So everybody okay. can look at the chat. Got and see. it. Got yeah. it. Um, 
then I will do that and that will take care of that. And um, here we go, right there. Mm. How about that? Perfect. That looks now good. You can, you can cut and paste and you don't have to put that, you know, there's some handbooks you'll go through and read that it literally has this phrase, like every section, right? It's like, I have to make sure that it's in every section to remind everybody all the way. You just have to have it once. Don't take up more space than you need to. Just know that it's in there and any violation of any of this nonsense. And, you know, we can sing hit the road, Jack. <laughs> awesome. All right, uh, this one is from Luke. Luke said, driving the rural routes up here in the fall is like going to a fireworks show once the leaves start to change. That is Aww. so, that's awesome. That's <laughs> what a great yeah. image, yeah. yeah. Um, I feel like the leaves only last for, like Josh said, like maybe two weeks and then <laughs> we get like a, a freeze or something and they all turn brown and die or like we get a heavy rain and they all fall off. So it, it doesn't last long. So I envy, envy that Luke, but uh, Luke wants to know, and maybe this is more for Josh here, but he said, we're considering uh, splitting off one route to sell to a neighboring contractor. What is the best approach for this valuation that they'll need to do? Okay, so um, it, you know, if you were selling to the open market, we can do valuations and kind of help you through the process. Um, just so you know, kind of in general, how these are valued is that it's typically a multiple of the net operating income. So, uh, you know, net operating income, EBITDA, basically um, your profit uh, before things like what you pay yourself and anything you're paying in debt service or depreciation. Um, so a multiple of that. So typically these sell um, around in, in uh, around four to five. Um, so four to five times that net operating income is how you can come to a valuation for yourself. But um, if you're looking for, a, for us to kind of do a more robust analysis, just reach out to the team. We can see what we can do to help there. Awesome. Um, all right, this next one is from James, uh, and this is directed towards Melody. Um, but James says his favorite thing about fall is wearing a hoodie and sitting around a fire at night. Oh, that just speaks to my heart. I already got my flannel on today. <laughs> I cannot wait to do a bonfire. Oh man, so good. Okay, he wants to know, um, Melody, can you say more about seasonal hires specifically, and maybe what modifications do I need to make uh, to offer letters and employ handbooks for seasonal hires? Yeah, so um, you don't have to change a lot. The great thing is just putting that word seasonal in place of full-time or part-time, right? Um, seasonal employees, you know, kind of by definition are those that are expected to not be around more than three to six months. Um, so you, you know, you don't have to open up the door for benefits and things like that because you are classifying them from day one as seasonal. Um, so what I would put in my handbook then is when you have a section in there that breaks down the employee classification, so full-time exempt part-time, you know, hourly, whatever you have, you will have a new classification that is seasonal. And these employees may work up to a full-time um, schedule for a reduced amount of time. And it is still at will employment. So don't think that this changes that for you. Um, you know, Montana right now is the only state that's not an at will employer. And so you have to do a little few different things. But if you hire somebody seasonal, it's still at will. You can still terminate them if they're not performing, if they're not being safe, those kind of things. So you're not locked into that three to six month window at all. Um, you can still manage them exactly like you manage everybody else. You just need to put in your employee handbook what the definition of a seasonal employee is. So seasonal employee may work up to full-time hours. If you're paying hourly, then they're still eligible for overtime. Um, if that's how you're, you know, if that's how you're doing your payroll, if they're daily, they still get a daily rate, that kind of thing. Um, and that's really it. Like you'll still manage everything the exact same way. You just have to put that classification wording in there. Um, and I'm happy to help you with that if, if we need it. Awesome. All right. Um, uh, this next one, let's see, this is from an anonymous attendee. Uh, who says their favorite thing about fall is just the cooler weather. They even put a little yay with it. So <laughs> we're excited about that too. 
Um, they say, we have heard FedEx will not allow you to sell routes starting October 1st uh, through the end of the year. Given we are two weeks away from peak, um, it's interesting there are 10 new listings on your site. Can you comment on how that works in your experience? Great question. Yeah, um, so one thing I would say is that it's, one, it's often easier to close a line haul deal. The farther you get in the year, peak is just a little bit different there. Um, the other thing I would say is that the real thing to, to take into account is that the closer we get to peak season, the harder it is to close a deal. But oftentimes, if you're extremely well prepared or you can show that you and the seller have been working together to get ready for peak season, so it's going to be something you can, uh, where you're not going to be a risk, that sometimes you can stand up later in the year. So I think of it as really just to keep that in mind, the later we get in the year, the harder it is. But the more you can do to prepare and be ready, the higher you, uh, higher chance you'll have of being able to come in. Um, the other thing too is if the person you're buying from is someone who FedEx really wants to get out, that sometimes that, that can work in your favor towards you getting in uh, with higher likelihood. All right. Um, this next one looks like it's for Melody. This is coming from David. David says, uh, my favorite thing about fall is definitely the cooler weather and the changing landscapes. Beautiful, beautiful, big fans. Um, he says, Melody, is there any concern for an, uh, from an HR perspective, if I'm coming in as a new owner and implementing a handbook strategy that the previous owner did not? And I then hold the underperformers to a new standard and eventually let them go. Um, can you speak to that? And then maybe a follow-up to that. Uh, he's wondering if he's at any risk um, of a lawsuit by implementing this uh, as soon as possible. Got it. So, um, <laughs> so the risk is twofold, right? First of all, the risk is you're going to piss off drivers that you now hold accountable to something they have not had to deal with before. So that's the risk you have there. The second risk is that you don't hold drivers accountable for your standards. And so you need to you know, weigh those risks for you personally, right? Um, is there a risk by coming in technically, legally, any of those things and putting in a new handbook? No, absolutely not. It's 100% um, um, your business and you get to come in and say no different than if you were opening a store and you said the new hours of operation are X, Y, and Z, you are giving them the new hours of operation and the standards of operation. So there's no risk legally from you implementing it literally from minute one. And I highly encourage you to do that, to set the tone and say, listen, we got a new game here and I would love for all of you to stay, but these are the, these are the rules of this game and Annie up and let's go. Um, and no, holding, you know, maybe there's some uh, policy that you don't love, but you realize some of the good drivers are still tied to it. I don't know what that might be. Maybe it's that the good drivers can attend a safety meeting by phone and they don't have to be on site yet to do it. I don't know. I'm pulling that out of thin air. But maybe you put a grandfather clause in for some of those things. You could say, listen, I know this is something that you've done for a long time and it's not I'm not 100% comfortable with it, but it's not going to impact my organization completely if we if we do it. So we'll grandfather it. We'll let you have the next six weeks to work into the new way that I want you to do this. And I'll let you keep doing what you've been doing for a while longer. You can specify that, but you have to be really clear what that grandfathered clause is, right? So in some cases, we've had people that had a different PTO accrual in one organization to another. So we're like, okay, I don't want you to lose the PTO that you've earned. So we will grandfather you in for that because you have this much tenure, you have this much PTO. We don't want you to lose that. You worked hard to earn it, but you only have until XYZ date to use that. And then you are on our plan, right? So you can determine if you've got some of those things that you'd like to grandfather in, but otherwise... No, it's your game and you get to make the rules and you get to set what the what the Annie is for them to join the game. Awesome. All right. Uh, next one we have here, maybe Josh, if you have anything on this, uh, this is from an anonymous attendee, but uh, they said their favorite thing about fall, of course, is the fall colors. 
Um, he's, they said it's the best time of the year, especially if you live in the Smoky Mountains. I oh, am so yeah. jealous. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I love um, camping and hiking in the Smokies if I ever have a free, free weekend in the fall because it is remarkable. Um, okay, question. He says, uh, maybe it's a bit off topic, but any idea on the impact uh, to the FedEx space if there is a rail strike? Um, it'll have an impact. I mean, <laughs> in terms of how much volume actually comes to the FedEx network by that, um, it's questionable. It also depends on how long and successful that strike is. Um, so we'll see. It's hard to, hard to guess there. Um, but in general, that those types of things happening right now should lead to some level of volume increase, but I don't know nearly enough about um, the rail to FedEx transition to know how much that would impact the, the FedEx network. Yeah, it's, it's hard to say. Yeah. Um, all right. Um, this one is from Skylar. Skylar says, definitely the fall harvest. Mm. Favorite thing about fall. Um, Okay, he says, I am uh, treating the current employees as existing employees um, following the asset purchase agreement. Um, I think basically the question here, he says, I'm assuming I can treat them as existing employees, um, but the previous ISP contractor who he purchased these uh, routes from, who he got these employees from, said he needs to treat them as new hires. Um, what does he need to do for state or uh, federal compliance there, Melody? Do you need more clarification? I think I need more context. I mean, yeah. it's, it's, he's taking over payroll. So all of the federal withholdings, all of the state withholdings, um, all of that's going to, you know, immediately start coming out of payroll. So unless he's talking about um, from a benefit perspective, if it's just the payroll taxes and things like that, you're just going to pick up the books and you're going to keep going. So you don't have to start time over in terms of tenure or anything like that. Um, you'll have to do some paperwork. If anybody has child support orders, they have divorce decrees with medical requirements, you know, coverage or things like that that have to be reported. You'll have to, you'll have to do some paperwork there for those to show that it's now under your entity and your business name. But um, I, would, I would need a little more information to know uh, to go any deeper. Okay. Um, yeah, so Skylar, if you uh, follow up to that and just pop something else in the Q&A, we can revisit that. Um, okay, next one we have here is from Micah. This is uh, more directed towards Josh, I think, but uh, Micah says fall golf is the best. Um, I'm no golfer, but uh, lovely. I'm, I'm super happy for you, Micah. <laughs> um, he has questions about relay stations. So um, Micah is taking on a contract or pursuing um, a CSA with a relay station, but it looks like uh, he, he said, I'm taking over an a, a relay station that was established um, before FedEx had a, a real policy on this. Um, could you expound on the general rules around relay stations um, and maybe how they would uh, affect the contract that, the, uh, that he's taking over? Yeah, it's it's possible, but it, he should have had a he should have had a contract that already uh, was related to the relay station when the release relay station stood up. But if you got a new one um, that has, you know, if, if the contract was recently renegotiated, uh, it's always useful to see how those terms change, see how the revenue changed. Uh, but in general, when you're it's kind of hard to you know, it's a little bit broad, but when you're talking general policy, I'll try to answer it. And if, if you need to follow up, put it in the chat. But um, once a relay station st stands up, it's part of your CSA, it should be something that'll transfer, shouldn't be any issues there. Um, it, it's something that it depends on your territory, if it's something FedEx will allow and if it'll even be profitable for you. Um, but I, I don't think I've seen very many that got approved that aren't um, a great profit increase for that territory, where basically you're able to deliver with uh, a lot less mileage to your territory by having a relay station out that's far away from the terminal. So um, it, it, you might need to send, ask for, you might need to give some more context there in terms of what actual policies you're asking about that I can help with. So sorry if it's a, it's a, it's a little vague there. All right. Um, 
I can follow up with Micah after um, as well and get some more information. Uh, Melody actually had a question submitted by uh, one of my uh, consulting clients and they have uh, just kind of general questions around the employee handbook. Mm -hmm. So uh, one, is this mandatory? Is this something that uh, you, know, you have to have for uh, local government purposes or FedEx purposes? Is it, is it mandatory day one to have a, a, an employee handbook? Um, and if it is, does that need to be reviewed? Or even if it isn't, would you suggest that your employee handbook be reviewed by an attorney? Gotcha. So um, I doubt very seriously that it is a FedEx requirement. Um, Josh, you might know better than I do. Um, Not a it, requirement. I can yeah. say that. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> it is one of those things that, um, it, you know, if you, I don't know that it's going to be on a state guideline or a federal guideline that says, hey, by the way, if you have employees, you have to have a handbook that says how you do your policies. But if you're going to hold your employees accountable to things, you have to have a handbook. So, you, you know, if you want to identify and if you, you know, you're going through how are you classifying employees, how are you identifying them, what are the standards for that, for example, some companies may say that you are full time once you work 35 hours and above, some may have full time at 40 hours and above, whatever that case may be. So you have to have an official way of documenting that and making sure that your employees have that. So you do have to do, you have to have it. And if you want to hold anybody accountable for it, you have to have it. Um, it's kind of one of those HR, you know, we are going to bang the drum um, on and say, please, for the love of everything, put it in writing. Um, and that's just kind of where we live and breathe. And but yes, if you want to legally be able to go back and hold anybody accountable to it, you need to have a handbook. Um, do I think that handbooks need to be reviewed by an attorney? I don't, because I think if you have to have an attorney review it, you have way overcomplicated it right? Um, you can download, we can send you a generic one with very generic um, wording for those sections. You know, you've got to have in there the pieces of the puzzle that are um, non-discriminatory, what the definition of at will is, you know, what is grounds for termination. You have to have those basic things in there, but it's very basic wording. It doesn't have to be overly complicated. And um, honestly, your drivers are not going to read it anyway, but if you write it in legal ease, they're damn sure not going to do it. And you want your BCs to at least be able to speak to it. And so putting it in common everyday language is your best bet to make sure it's something that can be a living, breathing document for your team to refer to. Yeah, I, I would also say that from a, it, it's one of the most important things you can have to protect yourself from lawsuits um, beyond just holding your employees accountable. Having it in writing will, and having a, an enforced standard for all of your discipline allows you in any kind of um, discrimination suit to say that we have a standard that we enforce across all employees. They've all seen it. They all signed it. Um, and and it, one of the most important things to de-risk your business is to have an employee handbook. The next piece to that is making sure that you update it. <laughs> right. So you don't want a handbook that you had 10 years ago or that you used at your previous business and you haven't changed the business name. Right. So this is why I say, you know, I said a little bit ago, renewing it and reviewing it right before peak, right before you go on a hiring push is a great time to review it. It's, you know, a little bit like setting the clocks forward and backward is this is just what we do this time of year. And um, you can you can win unemployment claims because you can go back to your handbook. You can win, as Josh just said, the discrimination lawsuits. You can absolutely hold your employees accountable and they can hold you accountable. Like that's the win here is that they can come back and say, you said this, why aren't you doing that? Because you wanna honor your word too. And so it gives you both of those um, and it lets you set your standards. This is the standard that I'm gonna run my business by and this is how we're gonna live and breathe, so. Um, there, there's a lot that you need to have a handbook for and um, very little that you don't need a handbook for. All right, very good. Well, thank you for that. Um, I had another question here uh, from a client who wants to know when it comes to jumpers, uh, you mentioned them earlier, what kind of training is required if you are just a jumper versus an actual driver? Is it just a background check or is there additional paperwork that needs to be filled out before they nope. can jump in the truck? 
Nope. It is background drug test, and off they go. Okay. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah. Easy Personal enough. experience. You can become a jumper really quickly. <laughs> <laughs> But Josh, <laughs> I, I, if I can do it, anybody can do it. That's my yeah. answer. If I've gone out there and I've managed to do it, anybody can do it. And I have a very solid respect uh, for everybody <laughs> once going out and, and figuring out how long those days are. So, yes. Awesome. And how much it would cut down on time for or, or give relief to your, uh, you know, your normal drivers. So that's it really was. It was a great day. I mean, I, I genuinely had a great day. And <laughs> Once, I mean, it took me a couple stops, right, to figure out, okay, this is the path, and this is how to use the scanner, and this is where to find them on the shelves, and this is where everything is. But then he could take a break, he could breathe, he could check, you know, other things, he could plan routes and all the other things that were going on, and I could go deliver a package. It's great. That's awesome. All right. Uh, next question is from Faras. Uh, this is looks like it's more more directed towards Josh here. Uh, but he says, I like the colors of the trees during fall, another another color uh, fanatic here. Uh, but he wants to know what the uh, what's the average price of a line haul route? What are those usually going for, Josh? Yeah, so it, it's basically impossible to just say the average price of a run. I would say, as I said earlier, line haul businesses tend to go between a four and a five multiple of net operating income. Uh, I see people all the time who just try to say the going rate of a run. Um, the reason that's so hard to do is that the most important thing in line haul and getting that valuation is understanding the mileage of the run. If it's dedicated versus unassigned, there's lots of things that go into it. Is there a driver? Is there a truck? How much are you getting with the run? What terminal is that of? There's lots of little things that go there. So I don't think it's fair to ever just assign an arbitrary value for all line haul runs. Um, because really the profitability and revenue from the run is almost exclusively driven by the mileage. So uh, knowing that is one of the key factors in figuring it out. And then from there, there's just kind of, you got to weigh all the different factors that are part of that run. All right. Um, this one, another one for Josh here, I think. Uh, this is from Edward. Edward says, my favorite part of fall is the cool weather and football. I'm surprised we haven't had too many football fans. Uh, you, Edward, who's your yeah. team? Um, okay, I hope they did better than my teams last week. Oh, so disappointing. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, but uh, Edward wants to know, how do I begin as an owner operator for uh, FedEx line haul or Amazon? I'm currently a driver here in California um, and work for a FedEx contractor interested in the opportunity to become a contractor. Um, how would you go about trying to purchase an existing route? Just some like basics. I know this, we have yeah. like a whole 10 step program here, but if you uh, could- Yeah, like we've, got, we've got an hour, um, yeah. no, but <laughs> um, yeah. So just at, at the highest level, option one is you can buy a, a buy a listing, buy a route. That's always an option. That's always a way to enter. Um, either, well, really FedEx, it's, there's not very many Amazon freight listings for sale, if any. Um, so for Amazon, you're basically going to apply to their program, go through the training and they'll select candidates. Um, and, and, you know, there's a pretty big waiting line and approval process. So there's a chance you can get in that way. It's really one of the only ways to get into the Amazon freight program right now. Um, on the line haul side for FedEx. So there's always option one, like I said, buy a route. Um, if you're not buying a route, then the other way you can sometimes get into the space is through the Builder Ground Biz portal, where they will post line haul runs that they are essentially giving away for free at a terminal. Um, those will not come with trucks or drivers, so there's going to be uh, a lot of startup costs there as well. But the important thing to know is that if you are coming in new, you will need at least two runs out of the same terminal on your contract to be a FedEx contractor. So you can't be just a, a single owner operator tractor. Um, so you will need at least two, but there are listings that'll come up on Builder Ground Biz where there will be two out of the same terminal or more. So if you're looking for um, a way where it's, you know, especially if you plan on driving, so all you'd really need is one more employee and, and one more truck, then you could do that if you could find a Builder Ground Biz listing out of a terminal. Um, if, since you're already a driver or a contractor too, one of the things too is you can talk to terminal managers and see if there's anything coming up at your terminal or something nearby. Um, but 
other through the uh, other other than through those postings or finding out from the terminal manager, the only other way is to buy it. Um, quick follow up to that, or maybe addition. I've had so many people um, have issues getting the uh, tractor trailers who don't have logistics experience. Would it be any different since he is a driver? Uh, maybe easier to secure a lease. Do you know, Josh? It definitely could be. Um, so you've got at least driving experience. They often still want to see ownership experience, but driving experience will do more than coming in fresh to the space. So there's you're going to have a higher chance of them viewing you as someone who is able to run a line haul tractor and operation. So it should help. Can't right. guarantee anything with with those leasing companies, but it should That's help. That's true. It's <laughs> true. Um, all right, uh, we'll send one to Melody here. This is from another anonymous attendee uh, who loves to have fires out on their back deck. Um, they want to know just generally, I know you kind of touched on it, but do you have any other good practices for avoiding uh, workmen's comp claims? <laughs> Um, yeah. So in this industry, um, if we could bubble wrap the drivers, <laughs> then, you know, that's, uh, that's probably where I would start. No. Um, you know, it's just safety and, and being careful, right? We know that, I mean, I don't know about you, but I can trip going up my own stairs and, you know, walking across the parking lot. Right. And so, um, the, the more we rush, and, and that's, a, that's a tough thing, but telling your drivers, when you get out of the truck, take your time, get the package out, be careful, go up. There's lots of different equipment that you can get, whether it's a back brace to help with the heavy lifting. Um, if you've got people that, you know, you're in icy areas, then ankle braces and things like that, you can get the no slip, um, uh, the, no, the no slip grips that go on the steps and, and in the trucks and things like that. Um, you know, keeping gloves on when they're moving the boxes will help their hands from getting sweaty or getting too cold. And so they lose their grip. Things like that are just those little things that you can do. The challenge with safety and workers' comp issues and injuries is that it is out of your hands and it is in their hands to do things the right way or not. And so honestly, you know, you can, you can incentivize them, which I don't love because then what happens is they don't necessarily report things that they should, but it is one way to try to keep everybody safe and, and doing what they need to do. But having those repeated conversations, when you see an oversized package, talking to that driver about how are you going to get this in and out of the truck, where's it going so that, you know, if they're delivering it up 15 stairs to get to somebody's, you know, front door or whatever, that you're talking about what that's going to look like for that driver and really deciding the best way to handle those packages and those kind of things. Um, it's, you know, roll out if you haven't already, if you have the ability, if anybody does get injured and they go to the doctor, they have to get a drug test, right? So anytime there is an injury or an incident, now I'm not saying a paper cut, don't send them, right? Mm -hmm. But if there's something that involves a bone or a joint or an ankle, knee kind of thing, um, then we make them get a drug test. At the same time, they have to go see the doctor and they don't get to say no to the drug test, right? They have to get it within 12 hours. And that will save you on some of those workers' comp claims because if they fail the drug test, then they have caused this injury. And so that'll, you know, that'll help you out with that. But this one is really tough because it is 100% in the hands of the drivers. Uh, this is a random question I just thought of, and I know we're running out of time here, so I'll probably pitch one more to Josh and one more to Melody. Uh, but when it comes to drug testing, <laughs> does each terminal have a specific location where you have to send those drivers, like all of the drivers in that terminal go to this location, or is it contractor uh, based, like whatever they prefer? Uh, what? How does that look? So, um, are you good if I answer, or Josh? Yeah, yeah. Mel yeah, I was assuming Melody, maybe. Yeah. Um, yeah, so there will be at each terminal, they will have a list of locations that already know if it's the first DOT physical, the bills go back to FedEx. So 
that's the thing to know. And if you don't have that list, ask for it, right? Because if your driver goes someplace else, then you get that bill, then you have to try to get it rerouted over to FedEx and all those things. But if they go to the one that is already pre-approved and already set up in the system, those bills go straight to FedEx and you don't have to deal with it. Now that is just for the first DOT physical. The renewals are on you. All right. Um, this one is for Josh. This is from Richard. Um, Richard, I'm going easy on you. I'm going to let you slide today, but you didn't tell us your favorite thing about fall. <laughs> um, we'll pretend Richard is a Tennessee Titans fan and he loves watching, uh, them lose by one point. Um, so <laughs> that was, uh, that was uh, supposed to be a joke. Uh, he, <laughs> Richard, Richard says the decrease in volume in our terminal has been alarming. Is this a trend across the sector or unique to FedEx ground? Josh, any insight there? Yeah, it's more of a general uh, industry-wide trend we've seen. Um, and, you know, we're expecting in the next few months that it's going to start to trend up again. So I wouldn't say that it's necessarily something unique to FedEx or FedEx where it's a, a FedEx specific problem. If, you'll, if you look around at, at other um, parts of the industry, um, you'll see similar volume trends. That's true. And I've heard a lot of people talk about um, on the brokerage side, people not ordering as much right now because they are gearing up for the holidays. So I don't know if that has anything to do with it, but I'd like to assume it did just looking at trends over the years, um, what happens this time of year. So, um, all right, Melody, we have uh, a question for you. Uh, lots of questions about the, the jumpers that we talked about. So um, favorite thing about fall, the colder weather, what is the minimum age for a jumper and does that vary state to state? Um, and then in addition to that, still related to jumpers, can you maybe touch on like pay for them? Do they have a salary or is it just like a everyday type of thing? Um, give us so, some more details on uh, jumpers. Yeah, so 18, um, they can't be younger than 18, but they can they can be a jumper at 18. So it's actually a great job for a high school senior or you know a college freshman. It's a great, great side gig. Um, our practice was to pay them a daily rate. It was a much lower daily rate than the drivers, but we only used them as needed. We had very few that had a set schedule. So we would use them a lot of times on the weekends because that's when our drivers needed a little bit of a break kind of thing. Um, obviously during peak season, that kind of thing, but paying them a daily rate made it super easy to say, you know, they're, they're working one day this week. I know what my budget's going to look like. I know what my payroll is going to look like, or they're going to work three days. I know what it's going to be, you know, that kind of hundred bucks a day, whatever the case may be. As long as the daily rate divided down to an hourly doesn't get them below minimum minimum wage, then you're good to go. Okay. Um, awesome. Well, it looks like we have time for one more question, maybe. Um, please one last one in. <laughs> yes, yes. So um, let's see. I think we answered this one already, but uh, yes, you can introduce a handbook at any time. Melody mm -hmm. gave you plenty of um, options to do that, but it seems like a great idea to do that before peak season, um, especially Mr. Anonymous, if you don't already have one, uh, go ahead and do that ASAP. <laughs> um, okay. Just real quick, Bridget, in yeah. there, if you are replacing one or you're putting out a new one, just make sure that there's a statement in there that says this handbook supersedes any others, right? And so then you just redo it and you get it in there and you're good to go anytime you want. Okay, great. Um, and this last one today is from Michael. Michael says his favorite thing about fall is a hoodie by the fireplace. Hoodies are great. I miss yes. <laughs> I've been waiting till it's cold enough to actually wear this, this new one I got. I got it for my birthday, which is in <laughs> June. So I've been holding on to it for quite a while. Um, yeah. But he wants to know, is there any real long-term risk from Uber Freight or other similar technologies that you're seeing pop up in the space, Josh? So if we're saying long-term is in 20 years, probably, um, but next five to 10, it's, it's questionable. Um, I, I wouldn't worry about anything shorter than five years for sure. Um, we'll see how those develop. I mean, it's technology like that. It, it's, it hasn't progressed at a rate fast enough where I'm worried yet. Um, but you know, those kinds of things can make leaps and bounds in years, but as of right now, it's not in, it was, it's not in any of our short term, which is in the next five years. It's not in any kind of, um, uh, really on our, our roadmap at all in terms of things to worry about. 
Awesome. All right. Well, I know there was a few we didn't get to today, but I think we did a pretty good job. Um, so thank you, Melody. Uh, Josh, it's always a pleasure to be here with you as well. So uh, that does it for our Wednesday webinar. All right. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you.